Good afternoon, everyone. There may be some who are still coming in, finding seats, parking. That is no worry whatsoever. We want to say thank you on behalf of the family for your love, your care and support here uh, for them all throughout not only today but in the days leading up to, to this. Um, for those of you who were at the, the crematorium and in those precious, sacred moments as we, we laid Major Mervyn to rest after a, a lifetime of, of service, but we then came to the thought that actually he was more than just a Salvation Army officer. Although you, many of you knew him as that, or some of you did, there are others of you who knew him as, as, a, as a friend, as a neighbour, uh, as, as a colleague, uh, and maybe just one or two, as a husband and a father and a granddad and a father-in-law. Okay, important. Out of all the father-in-laws in the world, I think he would be in a good one. I'm very fortunate. I've got a good father-in-law, and if you've had that experience, then that, that's great. So we welcome you this afternoon. We welcome you to a time of giving thanks for this life well lived. For a man whose life has impacted near enough everybody here that is in this meeting this afternoon. When uh, the, the plans for today were drawn up, there were a number of Bible readings that were asked for and uh, one that you will see here is uh, taken from John's Gospel. Now, I have to say this. We, as family and friends, as officiating officers, etc., etc., have worked long and hard to proofread this, proofread this order of service and missed this one. So if you're actually making notes and you have a pen to hand... The Bible reading that I'm about to bring to you is the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 14, verses 1 to 6, and then chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Let not your hearts be troubled. <laughs> you believe in God? Jesus said, believe also in me, in my Father's house. There are many rooms, and if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going? Well, one of the disciples, whose name was Thomas, said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And earlier on in his Gospel account, John had recorded other words of Jesus. And this time in the context of having come to the graveside of a dear friend of his. And Jesus was able to say, to those who were grieving, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I hope that you do. I know who I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. That's the, the words that uh, we associate with the tune that the band played at the commencement of our, our time together this afternoon. I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Which day? Any day. Any day, putting our trust in God is a day that is special for each one of us. 
We're going to sing together. And the song that's been chosen that you have in your order of service is In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. And the words of this song through the verses remind us that here in the love of Christ we stand, we live in the death of Christ, we're bought with the precious blood of Christ. And the last verse, till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. And we give thanks because Mervyn did just that. He stood in the power of Christ until he was called home. So if you're able, let's stand and we'll sing the four verses through, please. Thank you. Thank you. Please sit down. And now for these next few moments, I invite you to sit quietly. And the band, we're grateful to our, all our musicians throughout today who have helped us so well throughout our services. And the band will bring to us now an arrangement of the hymn tune, Colm.
There are times when we need just to be still. There are times for activity and energy. There are times when we need to do all those kind of things that are needful for life. But Mervyn knew the balance between work and rest. He knew the difference between energy and rest. And he knew that in all those kinds of things, central to it all was his faith. Margaret, you knew him better than any here in this room. And to you, we stretch out our love and our prayers at this time. For Julian and Kerry, for your dad, what a special man. And then Julian with Deborah and then your, your girls there, Alyssa, Alex and Charlotte. For you and then the close friends and family. As the ripples go out from where we are, so the influence spreads. And then we cast our eyes around this room. And you know exactly where your paths crossed with Mervyn Baker and how special that was. This day has been steeped in prayer from so many quarters. This day has been surrounded by love and affection and greetings and cards and letters and calls and all those kinds of things. But in it all, in it all and through it all, simply that connection needs to be made. And we believe a connection with God, our loving Heavenly Father, at the heart of it all. There are times when things do get on top of us. There are times when things will get on top of us. And thoughts and tears and laughter all mingle in together. And in it all, my personal experience is that God is at the heart of all that in Jesus. And it is our faith in Jesus that is important to us who are Christian. Allow me please to make a prayer. And in making this prayer, I want to draw you all in. If my arms are long enough, I want a group hug. Okay. So we all say, Amen to this. Father God, where would we be were it not for love that has been shown to us? Where would we be were it not for the fact that you loved us in Jesus from the moment of that nativity as the babe in the manger through his life and his teaching, through his healing and his ministry, through his sacrifice and death, and through his giving of himself for us all so that we may not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you for the gift of love. And we thank you for the opportunities that we have to feebly at times, but yet not the less sincerely, try to share love one with another, to look out for one another, to call out to one another and to care for one another. Father, forgive us for the times when we fail. Forgive us for the times when our love is but a poor reflection of that which has been shown to us. And in these moments that we have today, as we remember with great fondness, with great dignity and honour, the man Mervyn Baker, we pray that the love of God that was evident in his life and shown to those firstly closest to him and then more and more and more people coming under that influence. We thank you for his life 
and we pray your particular blessing upon those who mourn him deeply this day. We make our prayer in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. He giveth more grace when our burdens grow greater. There's a great old hymn of the church, this. A, a hymn which talks about, sorry, can I just say, sorry, we're in the Salvation Army. It's a song, okay? I'm going to struggle if I'm going to have to say hymn every time, okay? This is a song of the Salvation Army. We sing it as other churches do. But it talks about the love that is shown to us when we've got to the end of ours, then his forgiving, Father's forgiving, is coming again and again to us. We've got a lovely tune which may, I hope, be familiar to most, if not all. It's the tune of Blacklands. It was written by a Salvation Army officer by the name of Ray Steadman Allen. Some of you may have heard of him. Um, if you haven't, don't worry, he won't be offended. And uh, I'm going to ask the band maybe if they could just play the tune through for us once and uh, then we will sing the three verses. Please remain seated as we sing. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to have a, a tribute in words and pictures that has been compiled by members of the family. So uh, we tried it this morning. It all worked. Here we are, remembering Mervyn. Those words we have just sung became very meaningful for us, especially over these recent difficult weeks. We have been deeply touched by the many kind messages of love and support we have received, and some of the words that will come up on the screen have been used by friends and acquaintances to describe Mervyn. As a family, we invite you now to share something of our joys during his life. His loss is hard to bear. The piano keys have fallen silent. 
but the beautiful melody of his life will always be playing in our hearts. Enjoy these next few moments. Treasured memories of my big brother Mervyn are as a caring and encouraging brother growing up together in painting, playing piano duets and also accompanying his xylophone solos. I also treasure Mervyn's Christian love and values shown in our weekly telephone conversations, always inquiring too how the family were. Thank you Mervyn, your light will always be with us. Wasn't that just perfect? Wasn't that just lovely? Things about Mervyn Baker that I never knew. How many people have just made a list? A xylophonist, violinist, 
trampolinist. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for putting that together. Perfect. Thank you. Of course, Mervyn and Margaret's association with Mulvan is well known, has been for a while. I had the privilege of being appointed from the training college to be the commanding officer of the Mulvan Corps. When told on the Royal Albert Hall platform that that was to be my lot in life, I thought to myself as I walked away, where? I soon discovered where Malvern was. And it was within a nanosecond of arriving in Malvern. And uh, the dear friends, Margaret and David Harris, said to me, of course you do know, we've lost four of our key players here, haven't we? And they're still talking about Margaret and Mervyn. And Peter and Valerie, who left Malvern together to go into the training college just a couple of years earlier, to four years earlier. And then, of course, in retirement, Mervyn and Margaret offered themselves to go back there and uh, served for many faithful years there with the dear folk at Malvern. And we, we salute and acknowledge that work that has had its impact even to this day. And so our next song here, the words are here, to the hills. I, lift, I don't know whether this was why it was chosen. To be perfectly honest, with you, um, Ernest Rance, Salvation Army poet and, and uh, composer, uh, wrote the tune of Ochils for this because of the hills in Scotland, not Malvern, Scotland. But I can still think of the Malvern Hills, can't I? As we sing this and recognise the hand of God in all that we see round and about us. And so I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able. And we're going to sing the three verses of this song through. Thank you.
Thank you. Please be seated. Mervyn and Margaret asked for two people to speak specifically today to represent us all in aspects of the, the life of Mervyn. And firstly, Bill Tompkins is going to come and, and speak. And uh, when Bill has finished speaking, he may introduce himself, I'm sure he will. And then Majors Roy and Meryl Fenimore are good friends for a long, long time. I won't say how long. You're okay. Say, secret safe with us. They're also going to come and speak. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Margaret, for the great honour of asking me to speak to this gathered assembly, paying tribute to my dear friend Mervyn. I would normally speak ad lib, but I'm anxious that I don't get off the point, so please forgive me if I read rather than just natter. Mervyn and Margaret have been special friends of Karen and me for over 60 years. And it's a great privilege to share these thoughts with you all. As a boy, I started at Torquay Grammar School in 1952, a year, before, a year after Mervyn. Boys came from all over Torbay. Torquay boys would walk to school. Paynton and Brixham boys came on a number 12 bus which stopped outside the school or by train to nearby Tor Station. And I think it's fair to say that these various travelling arrangements didn't do much for overall social mixing. It must have been a while before Mervyn and I got to know each other my earliest memory is of Mervyn playing timps in the school orchestra, but for which particular occasion, I'm afraid I can't recall. Jump forward to spring, summer 1961. I was teaching for the year before going to Newton Park College in Bath. The school where I was teaching was in Paynton, where Mervyn lived. And I must have seen Mervyn somewhere in the town. A brief chat, and we agreed to meet up for a proper conversation. When we met up, I told him I had a place at Newton Park to train as a secondary music teacher, starting in September. Mervyn was obviously interested, but I told him that the application process had taken place the previous autumn. He'd have to wait until autumn 1961 to apply to start in 1962, a year after me. Obviously, Mervyn wanted to get started. He later told me he'd made inquiries, been told to apply at once, been interviewed and offered a place to start at the same time as me. Mervyn didn't let the grass grow under his feet. And for the next three years, we followed very similar paths. We both were doing the same double special course, preparing to teach music in secondary schools. We were both taught piano by the superb Jane Dawkins. We both did a lot of piano duet playing, especially on Tuesday mornings when John Richards, the tutor, was late for our music class. And we were both encouraged to study for a BMUS degree. Apart from our studies, we both fell in love with young ladies who lived in the southeast suburbs of London, a similar distance from one another as Mervyn and I did in South Devon. Similarities continued beyond our time at Newton Park. For instance, Karen and I had a son born on the 28th of June, 1969. Margaret and Mervyn had a son born two days later. Also, our daughters were born in early 1971, less than a month apart, and there was no conclusion, uh, no uh, um, prior agreement about any of this. 
and our career paths had similarities too. After some years, Mervyn moved from school teaching to become a Salvation Army officer. I moved from school teaching to train bandsmen for the British Army. Throughout all the years I've covered, the Bakers and the Tompkinses have met many times to share holidays, go to concerts, mostly orchestral concerts played by the CBSO in Symphony Hall in Birmingham, or just to meet up for lunch. The most recent of these meetings was at the beginning of May this year. We met up at an out-of-town centre called The Valley near Evesham, and local people may know it. As always, music featured in the conversation between Mervyn and myself. He said how much he was enjoying returning to work on repertoire from former times, including Mozart and Schumann. Already quite poorly, Mervyn wasn't letting medical matters inhibit enjoyment of his lifelong delight in making and sharing music. A couple of weeks ago, the cycle of our lives completed a particularly poignant full circle when what in our day was Newton Park College and now Bath Spa University conferred honorary degrees on former students. Mervyn's degree was conferred posthumously but is nonetheless significant for that. Thank you, Mervyn, for all the years of unstinted friendship we have been able to share. May you now rest in peace as your wonderful music rings out in our hearts and minds to the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Likewise, <clears throat> I would be lost without notes, so <clears throat> you bear with me if I keep looking down rather than up. That way I'll get through what I want to say. But I would want to say too, thank you to Margaret, to Julian, and family, and Kerry, for the privilege of paying this tribute to a good husband, a good father, a very good Christian, and a fellow Salvation Army officer. It was in August 1978 that four adults and three children entered the Salvation Army's training college in Camberwell, South London. And so began a friendship which has lasted over 40 odd years. It's taken us to meet up in various places, usually in a Toby Carvery, which was rather nice. But it's taken us to meet also in different parts of the country to share that meal together. And then as well as that, there have been many phone calls throughout those years at times when we couldn't meet up for a meal because of distance. In fact, Mervyn and I were talking on the phone the day after he went into hospital. And someone said to me, he's bored. <laughs> Would you give him a call? So I said, yes, willingly. So I phoned Mervyn and we chatted for about half an hour. As friends, we shared the good happenings and those that were not so good. Someone has said that friends are the family we choose. Friends are the family we choose. And so I got to know Mervyn well, his love for his family and his Christian approach to life in general. There have been many times during our officership that my wife and I have been more than grateful for such friends as Mervyn and Margaret. And at those times, Mervyn and Margaret were outstanding as friends, particularly with their prayer support for us during very difficult times, such as when our daughter died. At the training college, it didn't take long for those of us, and I think there's a few more of me, who belong to the Blow and Brigade yeah, Blow and Believe Brigade uh, group of musicians 
to realise that Mervyn was a very accomplished musician. Quite often when visitors would come to the training college and lead meetings, they would introduce a chorus and some music that we've perhaps never heard before. And there would Mervyn be with his old book and he'd be writing a stave and he'd be writing the notes of the music. And uh, thank goodness he put it in the right key for me. Because uh, <laughs> later on, he would uh, let me borrow his book, his music book, and allow me to copy the words and the music. You know, we're not really very sure if the Lord is short on good pianists in heaven or good trombonists, but he knows that, doesn't he? It's often said that behind every good man, a great man, is a great woman. And that also applies to a poet and a flautist in Margaret. And it was lovely on occasions to hear them play music together. As well as when we were in college to find out your birthday card had some quip. Roses are red and violets are blue and off it went. But the poet uh, and Margaret, they did very well and they made us laugh, which was good felt. We've also had the privilege of going to their two retirements. Not many as Salvation Army officers get two, but they did. The one in Newcastle, and then the one some years later to their second retirement at Malvern. They also joined us to help celebrate our retirement, uh, but we only had a meal. I was going to say a pub, but I'd better say a restaurant, hadn't I? <laughs> The interesting thing about that was the DC at the time was paying the bill and he had a little whisper in my ear, this is an aside, he said, Roy, I can pay for the meal, but if anybody wants something alcoholic, I can't pay for it. <laughs> Perish the thought. We also had the joy of joining them in celebration of their golden wedding and some of which we saw on the pictures. And they came to our celebration of our golden wedding too in the same year. My wife and I could not have asked for better Christian friends and we would want to salute Mervyn as a well done servant of Christ and as a well done proclaimer of salvation. God bless you. A piece of music has been chosen for our songsters to sing this afternoon, and it's entitled Written in Red.
Following on from that, some verses from scripture that have been chosen for this afternoon, which also speak of God's love for those who love him. It's Psalm 91, selected verses, and I'm reading from the Psalms Now translation, so it may not be quite as you remember it. Those who focus their faith on God, who find their security in him, do not have to live in fear. They're not left untouched by the tempests of this life, and they may be wounded by the onslaughts of evil, but their great God does not leave them to suffer these things alone. The Lord cares for his own and delivers them, even in the midst of the conflicts that plague them. If God is truly your God, you do not have to be afraid of the enemy that threatens or the afflictions that lay you low. Even the ministering spirits of his invisible world watch over you. They will not let anything hurt you except by God's loving permission and through his eternal concern. Our loving God has promised, because my children love me, I will never let them go. I shall feel the pain of their wounds and bear their hurt and shall transform that which is ugly into that which enriches and blesses. And when they cry out in agony, I shall hear and answer them. I will be close to them and will deliver them, and I will grant them eternal life. Amen. Our reflections in these final moments together this afternoon will be very brief. Very brief because, as I said earlier, it is impossible to encapsulate everything about this man and his life in even the longest of sermons. I'm not going to try. I just want to paint for you a couple of pictures. A picture of a man surrounded by his family in a hospital ward just a few miles away from here. A man who is expressing both his love for his family and his love for his Lord Jesus almost in the same breath. A man who at the end of his life who when he knew it was at the end of his life, could have descended into all kinds of different directions of guilt or anger or doubt or fear. No, he remained resolute in his love for his family and his love for his faith and was demonstratively outward going in both of those to the nurses and the medics around him. To have the privilege of sitting with him in those final hours is beyond measure. Oh, as a Salvation Army officer, we have sat at the bedside of many, but some have been too ill to talk, some have been clinging on to the hope of some kind of miraculous recovery. But Mervyn Baker was a man who knew his destination, who knew his faith would hold him fast, and knew he had a faith that he could entrust not only to Margaret, his dear, loving wife, but to Julian and Kerry and to the grandchildren and all, his sister and all who loved him. Those were special moments. Special moments because he was and he is 
a special man. He's a child of God. How much more special can you get? And whether you have faith or none at this stage in your life, you cannot but be impressed by that image that I have in my mind of sitting with Margaret and with Mervyn and talking of faith and talking of family and talking of hope and now giving thanks because that hope has been fulfilled. Do you have hope? Do you have hope at this point in your life? Mervyn knew hope in Jesus was a thing that saw him through. And we, we who remain, have that hope. Even though you may not understand it fully. Have that faith even though you may not fully grasp its implications at this time. Know that love. Not only the love that you share for one another, but the love which comes from beyond us, which holds and keeps us. There's an old hymn that says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, written in red. That's what it was, the words of Jesus to you, to each of you. When Jesus says, I love you, I love you, I love you. There will be many, many thoughts and memories shared together as the days unfold. Questions? Yes. And I hope and pray that you will find answers to your questions. Here's a question. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me, who caused his pain? For me, who him to death pursued? Amazing love. How can it be? that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. Let's conclude, shall we, with these four verses. And then I've invited Major Ian Harris, our divisional commander, to offer a prayer and benediction upon us. And then allow me to explain the final music. But let's stand together, shall we, if you are able, and lift up these wonderful verses. <laughs>
We've shared so much today. Thank you, Margaret, Kerry, Julian, for all that you've allowed us to join with you. And now I would ask that we share together the grace as our benediction. If you know the words, please join me in saying, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you. Now, you may wish to sit down for a moment. You saw an image earlier, and you heard from the, the, the loving sister about the accompaniment of Mervyn on the xylophone. Have you, anyone here, family excluded, heard Mervyn on the xylophone ever? Yeah, you had a head start though, didn't you? <laughs> There you had a head start. Well, from deep, dark depths of an archive somewhere, the family have found a recording of a Salvation Army march entitled To Regions Fair, featuring Mervyn Baker on the xylophone. I want you You've got two choices. You can either sit comfortably and listen to it, or you can, if you wish, at the pace that the music is played, go and get yourself a cup of tea and a sandwich. The choice is yours. Listen to the music before you decide. <laughs> smile on your face he would love that go with a smile if you can show, show, join with us in refreshments afterwards they're in the hall just behind here and we're going to put the music back on so just we'll speed your way out of the hall here we go but thank you everybody who has taken part today and bless you each and every one of you <laughs>